May the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Galatians 5, 17. In today's epistle, uh, St. Paul courageously does the hardest thing a pastor ever has to do. He tells us unflinchingly the truth about ourselves. Perhaps some pastors find this easier than others, but there can be no doubt of the danger which comes from telling a group of people the reality of our brokenness and depravity. No one likes to be told they have cancer. And no one likes to be told that their most cherished desires, the very things they have been told make them who they are, that those things are an idol, murdering them from the inside out. Nobody ever wants to hear that. The far easier path is for those idols to be unmentioned, politely stepped around or worse, uh, integrated into what then is called Christianity, right, or whatever faith or philosophy we hold. St. Paul has a long list of sins he puts today, sins which mark men and women as the disinherited ones, the ones who struggle over death and ashes, rather than living in the gift of life and everlasting love. Enslaving ourselves to these desires of the flesh pit us against God in a mad, self-destructive contest where the children of men become little antichrists, preaching a false gospel to neighbors and enemies with every self-destructive choice and unfaithful decision. This is the danger the Apostle is warning us when he speaks of being against the Spirit, right? against the Spirit, fighting against God so that we can try and find meaning and fulfillment in the dying things of this world. There lies the danger of that uh, lust or uh, over-desire which rages in our bodies. Not that God has created inherently evil things, he hasn't, but that humans tragically again and again take good things and use them for evil. Perhaps the unique problem we face is that the uh, 20th century and the fairly new 21st century has brought more and more into Christianity and really all ways of thinking Language which makes talking about reality pretty much impossible. Right? Kind of an emotive language, a language of feelings, which is so untechnical and so hard to really wrap our heads around any real truth. If a 21st century priest says to someone, anything which prevents you from daily growing in trust and faithfulness in the Lord Anything which prevents you from walking the path of holiness must be attacked in the same intensity by which Christ attacked the sin of the world. If that's said to someone, the response is usually something like, that doesn't feel right to me. Or, my gut is telling me to do something else. What do we do then when St. Paul looks us firmly in the eyes and reminds us that when we talk that way, we sound like the kind of lunatics who think positive thoughts are why hurricanes move out to sea? After all, we are talking about the great war between good and evil. In that context, who cares about our feelings or our guts or whatever nonsensical metaphysical term we make up in order to justify doing the thing we really kind of wanted to do anyway. It's all window dressing. It's not real. St. Paul is telling us that we are not simply individuals navigating the world as we see fit. No, if 
we are anything, if we are alive, we are a church. We are the indwelt people, the people who God himself dwells in, the God who rules the universe. We, minute by minute, find ourselves in the presence of our perfect judge and merciful Savior, calling us to a greater and greater and greater union with the God of creation. The picture we must hold in our minds and nail to our hearts is that by nature of our baptism and rebirth, we are people over whom the Spirit of God has come to reside and destroy and renew. We can all agree, I hope, that we need to be improved in some way. I don't think anyone in here thinks they're perfect. Uh, uh, if you are, you probably won't pass the psychopath test, but uh, we'll talk about that later. So no one in here thinks they're perfect. But the only question that then gets asked is, how much do I need to be improved? How much do I need to be improved? How much better do I need to be? The answer Paul gives is that we have so far to walk that we actually can't get there by ourselves. It isn't that we don't have a map. It's that we don't have arms or legs. Humanity trying to save itself through the desires of the flesh or even the law is like a uh, quadruple amputee trying to walk to the moon. That scenario is just as preposterous as thinking we will be saved by whatever good thing we worship with our time and our treasure and strength rather than the living God. Here is why it was necessary for Jesus to come and free us from the enslavement of sin. Here is why it was necessary for Jesus to come and free us from even the law. As St. Paul writes today, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Right before he gives a long list of things that show we are outside of the kingdom of God, what's going on here? Well, just as Jesus heals the ten lepers in today's gospel reading, Jesus has come to heal us by faith from the guilt and shame and depression and false happiness living a disordered life brings, the fake happiness, the sacredness, the horribleness. It is no accident that St. Paul mentions impurity in today's epistle. Right? Impurity as one of these works of the flesh. For to live in sin is to live like a dead piece of meat, disconnected from the God who gives us being and life. It is to live like a leper whose rotting flesh marks him as being disconnected from the people of God. As in so many of the healing miracles, the unique pain and suffering of the lepers allows them to know just how much they desperately need to be healed and saved by the master as he walks by. The master who doesn't leave them to die in the street, leave them to be exiles, but who walks towards them. It's much harder to think one is the captain of one's fate when pieces of you are falling off over a period of time. The lepers knew they couldn't save themselves. We may even humbly surmise here that this is the reason why God allows us all to grow old and fall apart, so that we too might fall on our knees and say to the God who suffers with us, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Incredibly, of course, again and again and again, Jesus has mercy on people who don't deserve it. Israel's Messiah, the fulfiller of all the law and the prophets, shows the ultimate mercy by taking our suffering and pain seriously. Jesus doesn't snap his fingers and make it all better. No, that would make a mockery of our pain, a mockery of our suffering. 
The pain and suffering of this world isn't a game. It isn't a simulation. It is the working out of our salvation. It is the fitting means by which a new and perfect world is being formed. On Good Friday, the healer of the lepers, the healer of the world, allows himself to be broken by all the works of the flesh to reveal to us their utter powerlessness. On that day, all the idols of the children of men were exposed for what they are, uncaring and pitiless instruments of death, totally incapable of destroying the God of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. In the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the church has become a living witness to the ultimate triumph of good over evil. To live as if that weren't the case is a way that we are, a madness even, that our culture pushes on us all the time. Every aspect of it is tainted by it. But to live that way would be pure and terrible madness. And so, the Christian who is led by the Spirit is beyond the fear of the law, beyond the fear of death, beyond the need for works of the flesh because he is now free for love. We are now free to bear the Holy Spirit's fruit in the desert of human misery. Because we belong to Christ, every single part of us belongs to God. Not just our brains or our occasional Sunday church attendance. No, every part of us belongs to the God who made a wild and dying plant alive in order to bear the fruit of the Spirit. Our every second is no longer our own, but a double gift from the God who created us and is redeeming us for our present and future glory. This reality has immense ramifications for how we live our lives. We no longer get to say, I will try and make time for prayer or to contribute to Christian love or to share the gospel. No, that's how it can't work anymore. Our entire lives now are about being led by the Spirit and belonging to Christ. We work and sleep and eat not for ourselves, not to get more things than we can ever use, not to build our own little slice of heaven, not to worship the idols of our small and unimaginative age. Rather, we have all these aspects of his life, all the things we have to do, so that we can have time and space to grow the fruit of the Spirit, to grow the fruit which shows Christ's total and uncontested reign in our hearts as it is in heaven. As St. Paul says today, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. One can be a nice person. One can be a churchgoer. But one cannot be a child of God unless we want, above all else, to be more and more like our Heavenly Father in whose image we are made. We are damned unless our identity is so closely linked with Christ that we can freely give all of our ambitions and passions and desires to the cross upon which he died. Gladly, take it all. St. Paul makes no distinction here between sexual sins or interpersonal sins or financial sins or substance abuse because there's no place for any of these marks of death in the new people of the earth. No matter if our culture or society decides sometimes week to week that some sins are more sinful than others, none of this is up for a vote. How terrifying if it was. We either surrender and live 
to fight for truth and beauty and goodness and love. Or we continue to rebel, to live for ourselves until our bodies and minds betray us on our deathbeds. We can foolishly tell God, I don't need you, until we can't talk anymore. But we can't say, God, please save me, and then live as if the fallen world's lies are the things that are going to save us. They won't. But God will. So then, today and every day, let us be the most joyous and loving people on earth patient and kind, faithful to the truth. We have no reason to be gloomy or defeatist as the world around us dips further and further into madness and delusion and hysteria. No reason to be sad. We have been saved by the love of God so that we can get out and love the sick and the dying, to love the lepers who won't look in the mirror. There is still time because we still have breath. We have everything we need because we have the Spirit and His Church and His Word and His sacraments. If we center our lives on these, His fruit will grow and the world will be nourished by it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.